The eugenics movement got its start in 1907 in the United States when the first eugenics law was passed there. And by 1944, 40,000 so-called insane or feeble-minded people had been forcibly sterilized. Another 22,000 22, by as recently as 1963. Now in the 1920s, the Rockefeller Foundation, who became a principal promoter of depopulation, called for the mass sterilization and elimination of minority populations in the United States. And to head their program, they chose the fascists Ernest Rudin and Franz Kallman. Of course, it was Rockefeller Standard Oil that got together with IG Farben during that war. It became virtually the same corporation. It was Farben who made the nerve gas that killed more than six million Jewish people. Rudin himself went on to become part of the Nazi state and became president of the Worldwide Eugenics Federation. His sterilization law was adapted by the United States as law in July 1933 as a model with Hitler's signature attached. Kalman went on to head the American Society of Human Genetics, the Human Genome Project you've been hearing so much about recently. If you haven't heard about its Nazi antecedents. That's a $3 billion effort, of course, to map DNA by the year 2003, and they're well on their way. That's going to be pretty nifty, because apparently we'll be able to identify genetically caused diseases go in there and tinker around and eliminate those diseases. What they're not stressing in the news reports is that we'll also be able to identify race-specific diseases so that we can attack specific populations of people with diseases that will only kill them. In 1950s, the U.S. eugenics movement moved literally into Rockefeller's family offices. Lawrence Rockefeller became head of the New York City Blood Council and then International Blood Banking. These are the eugenics people. 1960s, General William Draper. He supplied credit to the Nazis during World War II, and now he started the Draper Fund. The Vietnam generals we've all heard about, Maxwell Taylor, William Westmoreland, who headed that genocide and uh, dioxin defoliation campaign in Vietnam. They were members of the Population Crisis Committee of the William Draper Fund. In 1964, the former commanding general, U.S. Army Chemical Corps, listed bioweapons favored by the U.S. military. There's a long list, I won't go into it, but let's note brucellosis, influenza, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Congressional investigations in 1977 and 1994 documented 50 years of biowarfare experimentations I mentioned earlier. 1969, a man named George Bush, son of the eugenics advocate and Nazi bankroller Prescott Bush, this is all documented by the way, chaired a committee urging world population control. Just one year later, Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor to President Nixon, issued National Security Memorandum 200 calling for a reduction of the populations of the lesser developed countries, that is the growth rate, by half. By half. He said, we have to depopulate 14 countries or the U.S. will face a crisis worse than nuclear war. Kissinger said we can decrease the birth rate or increase the death rate. It's too bad he said we can't use nuclear weapons. It's a little obvious, but we have something even better. In fact, it was Kissinger who took the U.S. biowarfare program underground when Nixon publicly outlawed it and declared the U.S. was getting out of the biowarfare business. Kissinger made sure that program continued. There was another national security advisor to Nixon at the very same time. His name was Roy Ash. He's the president of Lytton Bionetics. And anyone who's reading Len Horowitz's excellent books, AIDS and Ebola and Healing Codes for the Biological Apocalypse, will be running into this name, Lytton Bionetics. And they were tasked with developing immune systems destroyers and cancer agents. They were the head of all experiments at Fort Detrick and they were in charge of all monkey cultures and viruses in the United States. Lytton Bionetics, Roy Ash, National Security Advisor to the United States government. Let's get back to Mr. Kissinger. 
1969. What a year that was. Because during that year, in the closed door sessions for defense appropriations hearing, Dr. MacArthur stood up and said secretly, after 24 years of biological warfare research, research that was started, by the way, with the first head of that program, George Merck, the founder of Merck Pharmaceutical Company, also heavy funders of world depopulation. 24 years of biological warfare research, 76 biological warfare labs, $31 million, a lot of money in those days, that year, for these highness weapons. He said, let's add $10 million more to the pot, and we will develop the ultimate stealth weapon, a synthetic bioagent for which no natural immunity exists. He told the Congressional Committee, we'll probably have to deliver these as a primary aerosol through the air, and we'll infect people inhaling it. Now he said this can be incapacitating or lethal, depending on what brew we use and the victim's general health. Oh, he said we might have a problem. Uh, some people might think this is genocidal. We might have a publicity problem, but uh, we can do the job. That money was awarded. The work did go forward. And an immunodeficiency disease was perfected at Fort Detrick, Maryland. And it was tested at the Tahoe Truckee High School. And seven of the eight young victims there developed chronic fatigue. Now, in 1970, Robert Gallo synthesized an AIDS-like virus under this program. And two years later, the WHO said, the best way to test these new viruses is in vaccines, particularly among siblings. And isn't it interesting that in 1977, 100 million Africans were inoculated by the WHO, who set up a very high-tech lab near Angola in the middle of the jungle, and out of the goodness of their hearts, <coughs> vaccinated these folks for smallpox, for an epidemic of smallpox. But there was no epidemic of smallpox and they contracted AIDS. A year later, the hepatitis B vaccine was given to gays in the United States in seven major cities. And you know what happened? AIDS broke out in those cities and only those cities. And I mentioned the International Summit on Aging and the Implications for Business. Did I mention that today all 14 countries cited by Kissinger in that Memorandum 200 now have the AIDS epidemic? 5,000 people a day are dying in Africa, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, which predicts that AIDS will be bigger in Asia even than Africa. Talking to nurses across the United States, anecdotally, we have an increase in the death rate among the elderly in hospital wards of roughly 4, 5, 6 percent following these chemtrail attack on our cities and communities. A number that is not going to leave bodies piled in the streets. Oh, oops, sorry. Oh, we had a few incidents there in England. We had to bring some trucks in and haul them away, get them out of sight. But this is a significant number over time. And if it climbs to 10%, that's a dictionary de definition of a decimation of a population. In fact, Pope John Paul has come out with an encyclical railing against what he calls the culture of death in Western nations that he says are deliberately killing their elderly whom they see as burdens on society. So I guess if it's good enough for the Pope, it's good enough for me. And we have a real problem here, folks. Are those deaths that have been so often linked to this spray intentional? Are they really trying to do us in? Or are they an unfortunate and unintentional byproduct of a program that is seen to have overriding national security implications in terms of global warming? Or are the people behind this program getting two for the price of one? I'll just say this, that when you institute a program of mass spraying across the populations of the United States, Canada, England, Germany, as recently as a week ago, Holland, Italy, Australia, 
New Zealand. And at the same time, you know that people are being hospitalized, according to U.S. news sources, by the tens of millions in the United States. And you know your death rate is up in epidemic proportions for 19 of 20 weeks, and you continue to spray, I call that deliberate. What in the world can we do? We have been virtually disempowered by a political process that does not answer to the public by politicians who do not hold themselves accountable to anyone, not even God, and God help them. Thanks to the good people of Espanola, there is something we can do, and I urge all of you to do this and contact your friends and get onto your MP and demand, and insistently demand and persistently insist that the people of Espanola receive a response to their petition to Parliament in Ottawa they were promised a response from Ministry of Defense. That was about five months ago. And we want a response to them because in so doing, we will have a response to the inhabitants of this city and region. And I urge you, get on the facts, get on the phone, and don't stop until the people of Espanol have an answer. Until they have the truth, and we have the truth, and we have some accountability at last. Secondly, get on the phone, call the Vancouver Sun, my former employer, Vancouver Province, the CBC. Again, they've interviewed me at length, never ran the tape. And say, you heard this guy talking, and he has some very disturbing photographs and even more disturbing things to say. And he's a journalist, he's won awards, he doesn't appear to be too crazy. And heck, I've seen it myself, tell them. Why aren't you reporting this? And don't stop until they do. Because once someone in the mainstream media picks up this story, the others will have to follow. It's the herd instinct. No one wants to be scooped. Very, very important that we apply public pressure here. Very important that we take our power back, and it's very important to understand, though we've heard a lot of frightening things tonight, biological weapons, bullets and bombs and planes and money, that's not power. That has nothing to do with power. The real power is here. It's all around us, and if we align to it, if we pray for it, if we invite it into our lives, there is nothing that can stop us and nothing that can stop the truth. And the one thing the people responsible for this are afraid of the most, and the one thing they cannot counteract with all the weapons and money at their command is the truth. And the kind of power I'm talking about, which is the real power, will triumph in the end. Because evil of this magnitude always, always, always fails of its own accord, of its own contradiction, of its very evilness.